Buick GS convertible. Very rare car again, very fast car. That owner has some specific ideas on what he wants. When you start a restoration, people say, well, how, how do you want to do the car? What do you want to achieve uh, with the restoration? I believe that you want to have a car look like it came off the line. And I think that's important. And so I like to see proper chalk marks. I like to see, you know, overspray. Ultimately, I think especially with these 70s, uh, late 60s to 70 muscle cars, torque is really what it's all about. Uh, horsepower is extremely important, but ultimately it's what you deliver, you know, to those wheels. And I think that we want to make sure that uh, the car is as torquey as it can be and yet be very drivable. The key here is drive. And so, you know, if the car starts to have some patina, you know, on those seats and uh, on the shifter uh, uh, handle and the top, you know, looks like it's been used a little bit, that's okay because that's what the car is there for. This car is not going to be restored to just be sitting around. Well, the guys are really flying that legendary motor car on the Buick GS, and for a muscle car, this Buick has a lot of chrome. Great big bumpers front and back, lots of trim. The car also has lots of stainless. Over the years, we've shown you the different process, the chrome plating process, stripping off the original chrome, making sure that the steel is nice and straight, doing any repairs, and then the whole plating process. Stainless, it actually doesn't get plated, it gets polished using different types of compounds over a buffing wheel. It takes a lot of time, but well worth the effort. Well, today we're actually going to talk about plastic chrome plating. There's nothing like a restoration where the entire dash has been disassembled. Let's face it, most of the plastic plating revolves around the dash. Well, it's not just that, though. You get to the gauges themselves. Sometimes the dials actually have to be redone. The lenses, they can be polished if they can't be replaced. You can get all the fine scratches out if you take your time. The wood graining, well, a lot of that's available now, but you want to make sure you have different types of graining. You can see one's lighter and darker, and others are darker. Sometimes the console is a little different than the dash. Well, if you get to things like the cigarette lighter, the headlight knobs, any of those pieces, well worth get them, getting them new if you can or replating them if possible. The big item is going to be the dash bezel itself. Now, a lot of times you can't get this. You can get pieces like the radio bezel, buy it new. It's cheaper than getting it replated. Our friends from Vacuum Metalizing Limited agreed to do a few small pieces for us, even though they're in the business of mass-produced pieces, but the process is exactly the same. The metalizing process begins when the parts are loaded onto a custom-built rack. These racks allow for the maximum number of parts to be coated at once and drastically increases efficiency. The individual circular racks are then loaded into a machine that perform two functions. First, the parts rotate down through the machine in which they receive a layer of clear coat. As the part rotate up over the top of the machine, they pass through a small oven. This heat provides an initial cure to the clear coat. Multiple coats are applied at the same stage. Next, the parts are loaded onto a large rotating carousel. Here, small aluminum pellets are inserted into a tungsten filament that sit inside the center of the carousel. This is then loaded into a large pressure chamber and the air is pumped out until a specific vacuum level is reached. Tungsten filaments are heated. This causes the aluminum pellets to evaporate into the space inside the chamber. As the parts rotate inside the chamber, they accumulate a thin layer of the suspended aluminum particles. The parts are allowed to cool and are sent back to the clear coat process. Essentially, the aluminum is sandwiched between two layers of clear coat. After a final 90 minute bake in the oven, the part is done. After a thorough quality check, the parts are ready to be shipped. Now the steps involved in this are fairly involved, but well worth the effort in the end if you want that brand new look in the interior. Well, lots of times one of the most overlooked things in a restoration is the glass. Once you've decided on new glass, you've got to install it and make sure it fits and lines up properly. Well, there's an order to do things in. First off, obviously the door to the quarter panel has to be fit to the fender. That, that's the first step. The second step, this car being a convertible top, we have to get the convertible top done. Gary at Diamond did that, did a great job, it fits in there nicely. Now we've got to adjust the glass to the convertible top. Well, we're going to start at the back, and what we're going to do here is we're going to adjust this to what would be the C-pillar on the convertible top, make sure it fits in there nicely. Now we've got the main piece of glass in the door to adjust, and there's a few tricks here. You're going to start with the primary adjustment, which is these three bolts here, we're going to loosen those off and that allows us to move the glass forward 
backwards in the door itself. We want to make sure it seals here on the A pillar, on the roof, and what would be the B pillar here. So once we've got it sort of set up in the hole this way, we've also got to adjust it so it doesn't tip down too much here or tip down too much in the back. You do your primary adjustment with these three bolts. Then you've got to stop. You've got to stop in the back and you've got to stop in the front. And this is actually, you can see here, it comes to a point, that stop's gonna fit in this notch here. And we can adjust that itself on the glass. Now that, that puts it in the hole this way, but you've also got the issue of making sure that the glass actually follows the A-pillar this way and seals tight up against the roof. Now the adjustment there is fairly limited. You have sort of an anti-rattler here. You want it to push up against the outside felt. You use that anti-rattler to make sure that it doesn't rattle around when it goes up and down to move it in and out. Once all of that is done and all the glass is set in place, we gotta adjust the door card. And we have these two brackets up here that allow us to move the door card in and out. If you have to loosen off that anti-rattler a little bit, you can use the door card because there's a felt on the top of the door card that will allow it to actually pull, uh, push up against the glass and keep the glass again from rattling. Once you're happy with the way the window winds up and down, okay, and when you're doing a restoration, part of the restoration is the window tracks. Make sure they're all clean, make sure they're all greased, make sure there's no grit in it. If there's any sand from when the car got sandblasted, you'll hear it scrape all the way up and down. Make sure your anti-rattlers have the felt on it because if you keep winding it up and down two or three times, all you're gonna do is start scratching the glass again if you don't repair that. When it's all said and done, you put in your shielding, you put some dum-dum around here, put your shielding in, that'll protect the water from going in here. And then the last piece you're gonna do is install your door card, put it on, check it one last time, make sure nothing is scratching, make sure it's nice and smooth up and down, and make sure the door closes again. Well, whenever a customer comes to Legendary Motor Car, they're always asking for something a little bit different from the next guy. When we started this year, we did three different projects. We did the Prowler, we did the Buick GS, and we did the El Camino. Now, the fellow that we did the El Camino for, his big thing was he had to have the car back in six months for a big event. It's not so much about driving it. He may want to jump in it every once in a while, and because of that, we put the car on the chassis dyno. There's nothing worse than buying a show car that doesn't run, every nut and bolt is loose, every time you fire it up, it leaks out of every orifice. That's not what we're about here. Well, the second car is the Prowler. That car is a pure hot rod. Who would put 505 horsepower with a Porsche transaxle into a Prowler? Giant brakes, this thing is gonna be an absolute weapon. That car was never designed to go as fast, turn, or stop as well it's gonna do. So that car, we're actually prepping a little bit more like a race car. We're gonna make sure that we go through that car thoroughly. We're gonna beat the car, sorry about that, but we are gonna have to beat the car because the first time out, that car is gonna be on the power tour. It's gonna go a thousand miles cross country. It better work. Well, this one here, Larry's Buick GS, he wants to be able to take it to a show, hold his head up high and make sure that people really like the car. As I'm sure you're aware, sometimes people can get a little snooty uh, in the, at the car shows and they wanna you know, make sure you've got you know, your clips right and your, uh, the badges inside on the engine right. And it, and it is important to have those things uh, done correctly. But what's more important to him is he's gonna take it on the Muscle Car 1000. And most importantly, he wants to be able to throw his kids in the back seat, go down to the corner store for an ice cream. My litmus test is, you know, am I comfortable taking some of my family or all of my family in the car? And so that is probably the biggest thing that I look at. So no matter what level you're restoring a car to, to me, it's not just about art. You have to be able to drive them. We'll spend a lot of time debugging these cars so they're right. Let's take this one for its first road test. The whole thing behind a test drive is to make sure everything's working. The tack seems accurate, the speedo's accurate. Hopefully the gas gauge works. We'll also go through all the things like the radios. We'll make sure that the wipers work. We want to make sure that everything's functioning, and then what we're going to do is we're going to come back with a list. Any rattles and squeaks, we're going to check that. Right now, there's a little bit of a wind noise here. Now, again, these things didn't fit perfectly from day one, but what we're going to do is try and adjust it as best we can, make sure it fits properly, and then after that, there's not much you can do if it was engineered that way. But we want it to be at least as good as it was when it left the factory. Now, as far as performance driving goes, this car here, we did a little bit. We made sure we had good parts in the motor. We put ARP rod bolts in it. We wanted to make sure that if you took it to the strip, you wouldn't have any issues. 
As far as all the brakes and all the rest of the suspension goes, it's pretty much stock. So it's not going to drive a whole bunch better than the original car, but it's a pretty good car to start with. I can't help it. I just want, you know, brute force, brute speed. You know, I'm a car guy, so I like that stuff.